Hello, and welcome to Prostate Cancer Canada's Expert Angle webinar series. This webinar is titled, I am interested in participating in a clinical trial, what's next? And today's guest speaker is Dr. Paul Torin. Dr. Torin is a practicing ur urologist at the Chute de Quebec and an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at Laval University. Thank you, Dr. Torin, for joining us today. I will now turn this webinar over to you. Great, uh, thank you and thank you for the invitation. So today's talk will be going over what to expect in a clinical trial uh, for those who are offered and interesting, interested in participating. And we'll try and give a bit of perspective on patients who uh, may be approached with or entering a clinical trial. Uh, so, I'm sure this is advanced, there we go. So uh, just a, a mile high overview, uh, there are different types of clinical trials. It's important to understand uh, some key differences. Interventional studies are those where we're trying out new medications. These are treatments that are not yet approved uh, and they're often compared to the current treatment to see if we can improve the outcomes. Another major type of studies are those that are non-interventional or observational, where we're trying to collect information uh, from which to better make medical decisions and understand risk factors. So uh, if you're approached to, to participate in a clinical trial, what can you expect are, are the next steps? So the uh, first, the first uh, step is really uh, consent and screening. Um, and this is the consent to uh, investigate whether you are el indeed eligible for this trial. Uh, this, these, are, these are called SETI inclusion and exclusion criteria, and these vary the, by trial. They're often very strict uh, to ensure that uh, indeed the correct patients are uh, entered into the trial and to avoid any possible harms, and really to ensure uh, the chances that the drug or treatment is evaluated in the most optimal manner possible. And so this is quite variable between studies. Uh, some uh, questions that you should really be thinking about and asking at this initial point is, first of all, do you understand what is the uh, purpose of the study? Why is it being done? And uh, what are the uh, potential benefits for you, if there are any, to participate in it? Um, another question to consider at this initial point is whether do you understand the alternatives if you do not enter the trial and what does that entail? Um, another question which I think is important to consider is uh, regarding the specific risks uh, that you should be aware of or watch out for if there are any uh, during this study. Um, another key question would be uh, regarding what, uh, what does this entail in terms of visits to the clinic, in terms of questionnaires to complete, in terms of tests to be done, whether this is blood work, imaging, uh, what is required uh, in, as you're in your participation in the study. And finally, a uh, question to, to know uh, the answer to up front is who to contact uh, if you have problems or questions uh, during the study. And so uh, these are some examples uh, broadly of different types of inclusion, exclusion criteria for clinical trials. Um, often patients are selected according to the type of cancer you have whether it's localized prostate cancer, advanced prostate cancer, resistant prostate cancer, what stage is it, uh, what grade uh, in some instances, and uh, of course what prior treatments you've had, other medications may uh, cause it, you to be excluded, um, severity of symptoms, uh, and various findings on blood work. And so as part of the initial evaluation for the trial, there is uh, some screening tests to evaluate each of these things. Uh, this includes medical imaging tests, maybe a bone scan to see if there are any metastases or not, a uh, CT scan for similar reasons, uh, other imaging tests uh, perhaps, um, a review of prior biopsy or surgical results. We see this happening more and more with uh, personalized uh, medications coming into play and evaluation more often. This includes evaluating uh, tissue that was removed in the past, whether it's a biopsy, or a surgical specimen to see if it is positive or negative for a certain biomarker, um, a review of your medications, history and physical, uh, blood work and ECG, other tests that we consider screening tests, all to determine whether you're eligible for the trial. And this can take a variable amount of time depending on the complexity uh, and uh, a range
arrangements needed to be made for each of these tests. And so the timeline in general for most clinical trials is usually less than 30 days. Um, performing all the tests, uh, you need to book the scan, you need to send away often tests for biomarker studies to another place so, uh, in the country or out of country, and this can take sometimes a, up to a couple of weeks. And so it all depends on what type of study it is. Um, and some studies as well, I should mention, do require that you're off treatments for a certain period of time. So perhaps the previous treatment needs to be stopped for at least a month or more. And so this can in, in, incur certain uh, delays and timelines that uh, it's good to be aware of initially. Hey, Paul, would you mind just starting that uh, slide one more time? I just yeah. had a weird technical glitch on my side. Um, so if you restart it, I'll just uh, cut out this piece. Sure, I'm. I'm yeah, that's no problem. I, I just froze though. I when I advance, uh, it's not advancing. And this happened a yeah. bit before too. Yeah, that's a little bit strange. Yeah, that's why. Well. Uh, hmm. So uh, I, I I'm not sure. I'm on the. You can't get on the um, uh, wired network here because this is not. Uh, Shoot a Quebec computer, so I'm on the Wi-Fi, which may explain some of this. Oh, okay. Um, let me try again here. <laughs> it seems like you sound a lot better all yeah, of a sudden. Yeah, it might, now. but usually it's. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can go back and uh, start wherever you think it started cutting out because I see that this I have a three-bar signal, so it should be okay, but um, it doesn't advance okay. my slides right now. I think it was maybe just the last slide and then this one um, where I started noticing it was cutting out like a little bit more. Sure, but right now I can't advance my slides. Is that because it's frozen or? Uh, let me see if I can do it. Did it go back? I just sent it back to the screening test uh, slide. Do you see that on your end? Still in the uh, timeline slide. Hmm. On my end, it's on the screening test Ooh, no. slide. I wonder if it's just uh, if your screen might just be frozen. Work connection. This is what it's saying here. Oh, work Other. connection. Okay. Oh, there we go. Perfect. I think it was work no. connection. Perfect. Uh, I'll I'll mute myself and maybe we'll just try it again and hopefully it works better this time. <laughs> All right. So just one moment. Sure. Just let, let me check uh, with... before I get started here that I can control. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna do. I can control the uh, slides here. Okay. I'm not seeing anything. No, when I push the arrows, it's not. Uh, it's not advancing. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it might just be the the connection then. Oh, and and uh, my connection is. I think it's the connection because it just went down again. Okay. Hmm. I'm just trying to think of a solution. I'm kind of now. A, far away in my office. Yeah, yeah no problem. Um, I wonder well, if... Well, it was good when I tested it, but... Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'm almost wondering if it would connect better with a call-in, like over, a phone, over yeah, the phone. I can phone. cut out the video. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I can wonder call if... in because the video takes up a lot of data. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm feeling that's probably it as well. Larissa, would, um, what do you think? That's yeah, fine. no, I think that sound, sounds reasonable. Okay, we would need to restart the webinar over again, though. Would that be okay? Sure. Just sure. so, you, like, halfway through, you don't just kind of, like, disappear and then come and then... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sure, sure. So uh, what number do I call in, then? Because my... I'll get that for you. Just one moment here. I have it on my end. Okay. So I'm just going to stop the recording for a second. Hello and welcome to Prostate Cancer Canada's Expert Angle webinar series. This webinar is titled, I am interested in participating in a clinical trial. What's next? And today's guest speaker is Dr. Paul Torin. Dr. Torin is a practicing urologist at the Chaux de Quebec and an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at Laval University. Thank you, Dr. Torin, for joining us today. And I will now turn this webinar over to you. 
Great, and uh, thank you for the invitation. So today's uh, topic, we'll be discussing what to expect uh, in a clinical trial, uh, whether your approach to participating in one or considering to participate, um, what are the steps that you might expect to go through in regards to this. So there are different types of clinical trials. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not getting any. Um, One moment, I'm just going to resolve that for you. Sorry. So I it looks like the control. keyboard and mouse are already shared. Let me just see. I I'll try it again. No. It just when I, t I waited, sorry, I waited like three seconds and nothing happened. I yeah, don't want no to click twice. So. Uh, yeah, again, I pressed it, nothing happened. Press it again. Try to click the screen with your mouse first and then go to go forward. That's been a problem in the past as well. Uh, no, I'm trying that, it's not advancing. And pressing the arrow buttons. Won't right. advance either. Uh, yeah. It looks Do like I'm control? in the do I have control you, with my keyboard? I'm not yeah, sure I do. I'm going to add you back again. I'll disconnect and connect. There you go. Try now. Okay, so I'm pressing the arrow key. I don't see hmm. anything happening. I'll click again the screen, but... Uh, oh, oh, I just saw it go. Was that me or you? That was you. Oh, there we go. Now I've got control. Now it works. Awesome. So if you just want to start right at like once um, the part that you would have started right after Larissa, I could just patch yep. it together. That's fine. Awesome. All right. I'm going to meet myself. You can start whenever you're ready. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, what to expect in a clinical trial that you may be approached or interested in participating in. What are some of the steps and um, investigations and uh, things that will happen in regards to this? So first of all, there are different types of clinical trials. We have uh, what we call interventional studies. These are when we're trying out new medications or new types of treatments. They're often compared to the current or standard treatment. Another type of clinical trial is observational studies. These are studies that are not uh, doing an intervention or a new medication per se, but are trying to collect more data on the disease and what happens and what are some risk factors uh, that help us care better for our patients. So you've been approached to participate or you are interested in participating in a clinical trial, what can you expect or some of the next steps? So really the first step is what we call screening and this is the initial consent uh, for you to begin investigations uh, with regards to your participation. These are really taken to verify, first of all, that you're eligible to this study. Uh, each study is different and has what we call inclusion and exclusion criteria. These are often fairly strict, and this is for the reason that they have as a goal to protect uh, you against potential harms and to ensure that really that the drug or treatment is evaluated in the, in the best uh, possible manner. And so at this initial point, uh, what, what sort of questions uh, should you be asking, thinking about? Uh, the first one I would suggest is, do you understand what is the purpose of the study? Why is it being done? Uh, what are the benefits to you, if there are any, in participating? Uh, do you understand what are the alternatives uh, if you're not enrolled in this clinical trial and you decline to participate? Another question you might want to be asking would be uh, regarding the risks. Uh, do you understand what are specific risks in this study or you should be aware of uh, in, regarding your participation? Uh, at another level, do you understand what is required for your participation in terms of visits, in terms of filling out questionnaires, in terms of uh, having blood work or imaging tests done? Uh, so there's some things you might wish to under you should understand uh, at the get-go. Uh, and finally, uh, do you understand who to contact if you have problems or questions uh, during the study? So these are some examples of inclusion and exclusion criteria. These uh, depend on the study 
Uh, often uh, this includes things like what is the grade or stage of your cancer? That is, is it uh, localized or already spread? Have you already been treated with prior medications or not? Uh, do you have other medical problems uh, that may or may not uh, be related to uh, the cancer? Uh, also, the severity of your symptoms uh, may be used as inclusion or exclusion criteria um, and uh, variations in uh, your blood work results or imaging tests are also often in included. And so some screening tests uh, to evaluate some of these things include uh, imaging tests such as a bone scan or a CT scan to confirm the stage uh, of the cancer. Uh, more and more, there's often review of uh, prior um, biopsy results or prior surgical specimens to test for certain biomarkers. So when we're doing more personalized medical therapies, we want to often test if there's a certain biomarker in the tumor or the tissue uh, that may uh, be relevant to the study. Um, other screening tests often include uh, things like a history of physical examination, review, review of your medications, uh, certain blood work, ECG, all to identify uh, reasons why you, you may not uh, or may or may not be included in the study. And so all these tests can take some time. Uh, typically, uh, screening takes less than 30 days, and this is uh, finished once all the required tests and verifications are performed. Uh, it can take a variable amount of time due to the need to book imaging tests um, with the radiology department, the need to evaluate biomarker tests, uh, which are not always done at your hospital and may be done elsewhere, and so there's a certain delay in, in having them performed. Um, and this all depends on the, the study. Uh, as well, I should mention that some studies do require that you're off your previous treatments, whether this is for a period of a couple weeks or even a month or more, uh, it all depends on the study. And, the, and so you've gone through screening and uh, uh, you're not eligible. And so what happens? Well, I think you need to, first of all, discuss this with your physician and ideally you've already discussed this with your physician. Um, in some cases, rescreening can be done, but really this should only be done if uh, there's a reasonable expectation that it will be successful and that the delays are acceptable. And so if you complete screening and you are ed eligible, uh, what's next? Uh, well, this is uh, the important step of informed consent, and this is really the step that, to ensure that you are informed of the study, the benefits, the risks associated, uh, so that you can make an informed and voluntary decision to participate. All uh, clinical trials are, are voluntary, um, and uh, so this is an important step uh, for your participation. And this involves with meeting both with the study nurses and uh, one of the physicians conducting the study. So once informed consent is, is completed and the papers are signed, um, often we proceed to randomization. And this is really uh, where the treatment which you will receive in the study is decided. It depends on the type of study. Uh, classically, uh, randomization is between two uh, different treatment arms, but some the newer studies have many treatment arms. And so uh, this may be by random or like uh, by a computer system, or in some cases, a, it's not on a randomized trial. And so the research nurse will be involved with this and will inform you of the treatment, which is assigned. Um, and typically this happens on the same day after which you've signed the consent for the study. Uh, just a note, uh, there is different kinds of randomizations you might hear mentioned. A double-blind randomized trial is a trial where neither you nor your treating physician know which treatment you've received. Uh, we call an open label study is where both you and the physician know which medication you are getting. Uh, a single blind trial is where uh, one party doesn't know which treatment is being received. Um, more often the patient, uh, but it depends uh, on the study. These are less common. So uh, having gone through screening, uh, informed consent, randomization, what's next? Well, it really depends on the trial. Uh, some trials uh, have a lot of visits, uh, some trials have very few visits. Uh, imaging also varies by the type of study um, and questions being asked, uh, as does the blood work involved. Typically, though, this does res resemble standard uh, clinical practice, uh, though there is a tendency to have uh, tests and visits 
slightly more frequently to ensure safety of these medications. Uh, more and more questionnaires are very commonly used uh, at the beginning, what we call baseline, and throughout uh, until the end of the study to evaluate symptoms and your quality of life. So questionnaires are very important because they provide in information on your perspective, on your symptoms uh, uh, throughout the treatment. This is important uh, to justify the benefit of new medications to uh, government agencies. Um, this consists usually of either paper forms, questionnaires by paper, or more often now by electronic means. Uh, many studies now will give you a tablet from which to complete uh, all these questionnaires. So again, these are performed always at the beginning of the study and variable intervals throughout until the end of the study. So a research nurse is a very key person uh, throughout the clinical trial. They'll be your first point of contact. They'll be the person to which you report any adverse events or any new symptoms, uh, any problems. They're there to answer questions uh, regarding the medication, to organize the dispensing of it and they will be involved in arranging all your study visits, your tests, your blood work, and really uh, the key point of contact. Each study does have a study physician who's uh, responsible for the study, uh, for its proper conduct, for the reporting uh, of adverse events to government agencies and the study coordinators. And uh, they will address, of course, medical issues which arrive during the treatments and be involved in uh, decisions regarding that. Uh, studies may have uh, delegate physicians who are involved when your physician is not available or um, similar situations. So the end of the study, again, this depends on what kind of study. There's usually pre-specified criteria which uh, indicate when the treatment will be ended according to uh, the goals of the study. Uh, of course, you always have the right to withdraw at any time, uh, and this may be a withdrawal that's partial or complete. Um, at the end of the study, it's typical to perform uh, blood work, uh, questionnaires, uh, physical examination uh, to document the status of things at the end. And uh, to note as well that long-term follow-up can be very important uh, to understand the benefit and utility of medications. And so even if you do withdraw to stay in contact for uh, further follow-up, uh, be it just by telephone, is is important uh, contribution. So just a few other uh, comments. Uh, of course, uh, it's not permitted for ethical reasons to be paid to participate in research studies. Uh, that being said, if uh, things like parking and uh, meals associated with the uh, recurrent visits uh, will often be reimbursed uh, to uh, avoid any um, things that may uh, impede your participation. Um, and studies are often performed in multiple languages, but not all of them. And so really the key take home messages, I think that clinical trials are very important to improve our current treatments. Uh, it's the way that we have new treatments approved by the government agencies. Each clinical trial is different and you should be aware of the purpose of the study, the scope, uh, what is your participation imply and require, and of course, what are the risks and potential benefits. Uh, participation is always optional um, and so it's important to understand what it entails before deciding to participate. Um, and it's really, uh, the impact is quite large that these clinical trials can have on patient care uh, uh, going forward. And so with that, uh, thank you, uh, and we'll pass it on to uh, Larissa and the others. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Torin. We really appreciate um, you presenting today. At this time, I would like to remind our viewers that if you're looking for further information, regarding prostate cancer care, please visit our website where you can download or order free copies of our various resources. And finally, we kindly ask that you take a minute to complete a short survey following this webinar. Your feedback is important and very much appreciated. And if you are interested in viewing more webinars, please visit prostatecancer.ca slash expert angle. Once again, thank you, Dr. Torin, and this now concludes today's presentation, and we thank you all for joining.